live with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's Science Tonight. Now here's your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Hey, folks, welcome to Science Tonight. I am your host, Chris Smith. It's great to be with you once again this Thursday evening, where we are going to talk science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and more. That's what we do here on the show every single week. We meet interesting people making exciting discoveries across all kinds of fields and disciplines, people who are working to help us understand the natural world and make the world a better place. So it's great to be with you. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, if this is the first time you're tuning in to our show out of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, drop a little note over in the chat box on YouTube or on our Facebook comments, maybe just a little waving emoji. Let me know that you're here. Say hi. And of course, if you've watched the show several times, welcome back. I'm glad you're here too. You can also say hi in the chat box and let me know that you're here ready to enjoy the show. I'll remind everybody too uh, that as we go throughout the program, feel free to drop your questions and your comments for our guest speaker throughout the show. When the question pops into your brain, type it out into the chat box because when we get towards uh, the end of the interview part of the program a little bit later, I'll be grabbing your questions and posing them to tonight's guest. And let me tell you, we've got a great guest on the show tonight and a topic that is very, very interesting because it's two words that I would not have thought to put together, whale seismology. Whales and earthquake, earth shaking monitoring, uh, tectonic movement. How do whales and that go together uh, to elucidate and give us some answers onto what this is and why we need to know about it. Tonight's guest is from the University of Washington. He's the Jerome Paris Endowed Chair in Sensor Networks in the School of Oceanography at UW. He studies geophysical techniques to understand seafloor volcanoes, hydrothermal systems, developing new tour, uh, tools for seafloor geodesy at subduction zones, exploiting seafloor observatories for scientific studies, and this is cool, earthquake and tsunami early warning systems. But tonight, we're going to be talking about his research and interest studying whales. We are a natural history museum using seismometers. Everybody, please put your hands together and welcome to the show, Dr. William Wilcock. Yay! Thank you very much for the very kind welcome. I'm glad to have you on the program tonight. Uh, when you and I chatted before the program started, just to get me caught up on what it is you do, I was very excited to learn uh, about all of the cool science that, that you're engaged in out of the University of Washington. Yeah, I, I, yes, I'm involved in a whole bunch of really exciting stuff. I'm a marine seismologist, so my business is to go out into the oceans and deploy um, seismometers on the seafloor um, to record signals from earthquakes. And what's really excited me throughout my career is that you can also use these instruments to record the two largest whales, blue whales and fin whales. And they make incredibly loud sounds um, that are loud enough to hear on seismometers. I listen to them traveling through the ocean, but they actually make sounds that are large enough to go down through the earth and you can hear them come back to those instruments. And this is something that I've been interested in since I was a graduate student. Gosh, that, that's really, really cool and interesting stuff. Um, but you know, before we jump right into the science, just to get everybody warmed up here a little bit, I do like to play a short game with our guests, uh, just to, you know, warm up my vocal cords, maybe warm up yours. But I think you're going to appreciate this game because it has to do with seismology, which I think okay, is going to be like right up your alley. Uh, how okay. familiar are you with the 1990 movie Tremors? Um, not at all, I don't think. I don't think I've watched it. We have um, a bad movie night um, that's 
up in the Earth and Space Sciences, which is another department of the School of Oceanography. So they have bad Earth Sciences movies, but I don't generally watch them. So I don't think I've seen it. So this will be fun. Oh. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead, pull up the game, and let's rock and roll with your first question. I think you're going you're gonna to nail this quiz. Now, of course, uh, two out of three, you're a winner. Three out of three, you go in the Hall of Fame. No out of three, we put you in the Science Night Hall of Shame. Either way, there's no real prizes, so the stakes are quite low. Okay. But here's your first question. Which country music star got their first acting role in Tremors from 1990? Was it Reba McIntyre, Trisha Yearwood, or Taylor Swift? Okay, well, I haven't got a clue, so I'm going to have to sort of delay and hope that the audience can help me. Otherwise, I'll just have to have a complete guess. I don't think I've actually so, ever heard let's of Trisha see. Yearwood. Okay, so, but you have heard of Reba? I've heard of, the, I've heard of Reba, yeah, for sure, and, and Taylor Swift. Okay. So. I don't think Taylor Swift was old enough in 1990. I that's my guess to be so it's between the other two um an actor so it's a or b but i think i'll go Let's with the see. one i know uh, so i'll go with i'll go with reba mcintyre i think but okay reba's on let's see the correct answer oh reba is actually correct yes oh yeah and the chat just dropped it in there reba's the correct answer and folks in the chat play along too Go ahead and drop what you think is the correct answer as we go. That way, if uh, Dr. Wilcock needs the help, it's ready. All right. Great job. Next question. What name do the residents of the town of Perfection in the movie give the worm-like monsters? Do they call them doom worms, graboids, or earth suckers? Okay, so yet again, I'm going to have to totally guess. Um, I guess I could try and hold wait for some messages in the ch in the in the chat. Although I'm not getting any messages at my end, so I guess you, only you're seeing them. But I think I'm going to go with Earth Suckers. You go with the Earth Suckers now. Uh, is yep. that because you just this Earth Sciences poll? Yeah, just the Earth Sciences. It's got Earth in it. Pull. Yeah. All right. I'm looking to see if folks in the chat have any idea. Some folks in the chat got the last one right. Uh, let's see. They're saying that it's B, the Graboids. Okay, well, I'll switch and go with the audience because they probably know more than me. You go with the... <laughs> all right, let's see the correct so let's answer. Go with B. They're all saying the Graboids. That is the correct answer. Great job, audience. Thank so you very much. So that's two out of three. You've won the game. Let's go for gold. Our last question in Tremors Trivia. Which of these does movie seismologist Rhonda LeBeck and oceanographer Dr. William Wilcock have in common? They track wildlife using seismometers. Unexpected data led to the field of whale seismology and they encountered whale seismology while in graduate school or in Rhonda LeBeck's case, Graboid ecology. Well, let's, let's go with C. Let's go with C. The correct answer is, I went with all three of them. Oh. You couldn't have got this one wrong. Okay. From everything, from everything that I learned uh, chatting with you before, I was thinking about this movie and I was like, oh my gosh, they were graduate students working on research, found unexpected data, and then that turned into an entire field that they now study uh, various forms of wildlife ecology on. In her case, it was giant uh, worm monsters. In your case, it's giant uh, ocean-bound marine mammals. So there you go. I've got a movie to watch, so. Uh, right now, you've got some. You've got, you've got homework from being on the show tonight. So, 
I, I used that last question because I wanted to make sure that I had a way to get into this interview because, and you alluded to it right there at the very beginning, that you did, in fact, encounter fin and blue whale seismic data as a graduate student. So can you give us a little bit more of that origin story? Yeah, so, so I arrived, I'm British as you probably can tell, and I arrived in the US in the fall of 1986. And that just after the new year, I sailed on my first research cruise. And that was from the Cape and we sailed um, to the Cane Fracture Zone, which is in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and we left, I remember it was a pretty stormy evening and we sailed through a nor'wester and I learned that I got quite seasick, um, but we sailed south because the Cane Fracture Zone is just outside the tropics, so it's in quite a nice location. And the aim was this, was this place in the middle of the Atlantic when two tectonic plates slide past each other and generate earthquakes. And at that time, people knew very little about how deep the earthquakes would be on a transform fault. So we were going out to, to determine that by deploying ocean bottom seismometers. And these are basically instruments you drop from a ship that have a seismic um, sensor on them and a recording package. And they'll record data um, at that time for a couple of weeks because that's how long the batteries would last. And then when you want to recover them, you actually talk to them acoustically. You send them a signal and they drop a weight and they've got floats and they come back up to the surface. And so we went out, we were very excited to record these earthquakes um, on the transform fault. And we had a mixture of old fashioned analog instruments. So they were like a tape recorder that actually, rather than recording digital signals, they recorded directly um, to the, um, to tapes, uh, on tapes. And then you had to convert them to digital signals after. And then we had some very early generation digital instruments that you could basically download directly to the computer. And the digital instruments only had a tiny amount of storage. They had um, 12 megabytes, if that means anything to people. And that's um, probably the, the size of an 12. attachment you can send an email. Yeah, they were tiny. And so they had to record, they couldn't record continuously. They, they have seismometers which record the vibrations of the ground. Um, so they're basically recording the, the velocity of the ground as it moves up and down. And they could not, um, to, they could only record a few hours of data. So the way they worked is they waited for a loud sound. And when they heard a loud sound, then they'd save about 30 seconds of data because that was enough to capture one of the earthquakes. And then they'd stop recording again. Well, we recovered those instruments and they were a complete bust because they filled up with data in less than a day. And it turned out they had all these strange signals in, which turned out to be fin whales. I didn't know at the time. And then the analog instruments we got back, um, those instruments we had to convert to digital signals. So I would actually play them and listen to the sounds um, of the earth. We'd, we'd speed it up 75 times. So it would take an hour to play three days. So I'd have to listen to an afternoon of data and I would listen for earthquakes. And every time I heard an earthquake, I would write down the tape counter position. Uh, and then there would be a separate phase where I went in and converted those to digital data. And that was done on the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, they had several mainframe computers and I needed to use one for this digital conversion. And it took all the power of that computer. So the only time I could do it was in the middle of the night when nobody else was on the computer. And there were night owls there who would work nights. And so the only nights they took off were Friday and Saturday. So I had to do this all at the worst time of the week. Um, but I would convert these to these earthquakes. And we got maybe about 100 earthquakes out of this experiment. But we also recorded very large numbers of fin whales. Um, and I was very interested in them at the time. And there was an expert called Bill Watkins, who, who's now deceased, but he was, he was at Woods Hole. He was the expert in fin whales. He was very excited in this data because he said, you can track them and you can do all kinds of things with them. But it you know, my, my advisors, we were interested in you know, the earth sciences and I had lots of work to do. And it was quite hard to convert this data. So I never analyzed it. But I, I learned then what a fin whale sounds like and what it looks like in a seismic record. So then I knew all about fin whales. And so that's how I got introduced to them. And I then didn't work on them for 15 years. So I came, I, I came out to the West Coast. Oh, I was wow. um, 
came to the University of Washington and I started working doing seismic studies in the oceans off our coast. Um, but again, we were working with instruments that would only go down for a few weeks and then we got instruments that could go down for two months. So we would always go out in the summer when the weather's nice here and you deploy them in June and recover them in August. I never encountered fin whales, record lots of earthquakes. And then finally, sort of in 2003, we were able to do, get an instrument that could last a year and we put it out um, on something I call the Endeavour segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge. So it's a very active volcano and has a lot of big hydrothermal fields. So a lot of scientists here study that. And we left this array of instruments out during the winter. And then we got all this data to analyze. And we actually had never analyzed that much seismic data. So we, we ended up locating, I think, 15,000 earthquakes from the first year. And so we were trying to figure out how to do this efficiently. So we got a bunch of students. And so each student got six weeks of data and we actually taught a class up in the UW's Friday Harbor Labs. And the students, each student got six weeks of data and they were there for a quarter working on it. So for, for 10 weeks and we had some classes. So we were teaching them about the oceans and seismology, um, but they was cheap labor to locate these earthquakes. And they all worked incredibly hard um, but we found that some of them were getting through the data much more quickly than others. And the ones who were going slowly mm -hmm. were all working in the winter. And the reason why they were going slowly is because they were seeing these strange signals, which I immediately recognized as fin whales. And they would have to look at a thousand fin whale calls um, to be able to find one earthquake. So it just took them a long time to get through the data. Oh. <laughs> and, and these fin whales make these very repetitive calls and they're associated with the breeding season and so they're in the winter that so it's males making these calls and they they make this one second long call it's at 20 hertz so you can't hear it unless you speed it up um, but and they repeat that every 20 25 seconds and one male can go on for hours and hours i think the record is about 30 hours of people recording so they're i think trying to attract um, females and there may be other males there who are being intimidated but they're also very loud um, so they make sounds at about the same um, loudness as a container ship and and, it's, and so they a container which is loud ship. So any, yeah so anybody's been down in the engine room of a ship you know the engineers are wearing double ear protection and so that ship is radiating a lot of noise and so the fin whales can for a second make a pulse of sound that's as loud as that and then repeat that. So they're putting a lot of energy, a lot of effort into making these very loud sounds. That's quite impressive. So fin whales themselves, um, give me a little bit of background on them. They range in the sort of Pacific Ocean Basin. Are they worldwide? How You said they're one of the biggest whales. How big does a fin whale get? I imagine real big if they can be that loud. Yeah, that that they get to about um, eighty feet long. That's about as long as they can. They're not. They're the second longest whale after blue whales. They're actually quite sleek. So there are things like right whales are actually heavier than them, and so they're very very fast swimmers. And so they're found pretty much everywhere. They're not found in the Arctic Ocean, um, and then they don't across the equator very much. So there are separate populations in the northern and southern hemisphere, but otherwise they're everywhere in the ocean. And there are different sort of subpopulations of them. And one of the ways that you can tell the difference between them is the patterns in which they make their sounds because they all make these 20 Hertz calls, but in different parts of the ocean and different oceans, they slightly change the frequency and they can change the spacing between the sounds or they have characteristic patterns. So being able to listen to them is actually really important to identify um, sort of subpopulations of whales. Okay, so are fin whales migratory then? Do they move around like large distances that would make needing a way yeah. to track them like seismometers important? Yes, they do. And in the Southern Oceans, it's very well documented that they go down to near Antarctica in the summer there where there's a lot of um, biological productivity when you have a lot of sunlight and there's upwelling waters and so they're able to feed on zooplankton and then they go in the winter for both breeding and also for carving um, 
and so the, the migratory patterns are quite well known. It's believed they do similar things in the northern hemisphere because in the Pacific, a lot of fin whales are, are there in the summer um, in the you know, in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, but it's not so well understood where they actually go to breed. Um, and they, in my neck of the woods off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, there appear to be fin whales around year round. And so there's actually a lot of interest in um, trying to figure out, you know, where they're going, how they're using their habitat. Um, and people still don't know, you know, whether there are areas where they all carve. And they're extremely fast swimmers. Um, you can tag fin whales. There are ways of attaching a various kinds of tags. Um, and one tag is just basically a satellite tag, um, which can stick on the whale. It's actually inserted into the blubber. Um, but they have very thick blubber, so it doesn't hurt them. And then every time they come to the surface of the breed, that will say where the whale is. And those tags have been attached more to blue whales and fin whales, but the ones that have been attached to fin whales have shown that they can swim very large distances. So a fin whale on one side of the North Pacific might show up you know, a month later on the other side of the Pacific. So if they know there's food somewhere, they can go a long way for a good meal. And get there pretty fast too. Yeah, that's. I mean, one well, side they, of the yeah, planet they, to the other in just a few weeks. Yeah, though they they can stay, they can swim, you know, in bursts they can swim extremely fast. So they have predators for their calves, so they they have to worry about killer whales getting their calves, and they're basically when as soon as the calf is born, it's fast enough to try and swim away from killer whales. So that's how they can deal with that. So in bursts, they can swim very quickly. But yes, they will swim, I don't know, six or seven miles an hour is their sort of comfortable speed. But they think they can get up to sort of 20 miles, 30 miles an hour when they need to go quickly. Fascinating. So then is there just an enormous network of seismometers across parts of the ocean floor and you can track the whales as they move from one place to another. How do you sort of collect and understand whale data on, you know, earth shaking monitoring devices? Well, well it, it varies. The very, the first experiment that we did at this Endeavor segment, we were looking at very small earthquakes that are occurring just a mile or so beneath the ground above a volcano. So we had a very tight network of seismic sensors. And so we could record the same whale on all those seismic sensors. And since my expertise is locating earthquakes, I can almost turn that on its head and we can record a fin whale on multiple instruments. And then you just use a process of sort of triangulation. You know it's closest to the instrument that records it first. And you can look at the relative timing to, to work out where the fin whale is. So we did a lot of tracking with fin whales, but in this tiny little area. So we would see a fin whale might come in and cross our network in, in an hour or two. And then sometimes we were lucky and they would stay there uh, for a day. And we saw some really interesting things. We saw groups of fin whales in the fall that were consistently going north um, and they were communicating to each other as they swam and we don't really know we speculate that they may be adolescents that weren't involved in mating because we would be expecting that the majority of fin whales would be coming south in the fall having been f feeding in the summer and moving south to breed so we were kind of confused by that um, a lot of our other networks the instruments are too far apart to be able to record the same fin whale on multiple instruments mm -hmm. or sometimes there are just so many fin whales that you're even though you might have the instruments close enough that you're recording the same fin whale you're record you might be recording five or six different fin whales and since they all sound the same you can't tell which is which so you can't really track them so we've also developed various techniques that you can use to try and figure out how close a fin whale is and in what direction it is from a single instrument. So you can do you can do things like that. Um, there are seismometers being deployed all over the you know the earth, all over the oceans, seafloor seismometers. The U.S. has a fleet of several hundred. The Europeans do. The Japanese have some. So there's lots and lots of this data. There's only a handful of seismologists. I'm not the first and I'm not the only one, but there's probably maybe 10 of us who currently look at um, fin and blue whales on seismometers. So we're not really exploiting the data, um, but 
you know, if all this data was used, and I think eventually as we get better techniques to analyze the data and can automate it more, that will happen. We'll be able to very get a very good um, picture of where fin whales are, although we'll probably only be able to track them in a few locations. And so it, how has the process for collecting the data changed then over time? Because you talked about going from devices that only recorded for a short amount of time on detection because the data they could store was very limited, tapes, mm -hmm. um, up to devices that could cover a couple of months worth of recording. Has that gotten a lot better? Yeah, the, the seismic sensors now can go down for about 18 months. Um, as the battery powers gets better and the, their power consumption gets lower. The biggest problem now of having these totally autonomous instruments is having clocks that are accurate enough that are low power, because you can get very accurate timing from an atomic clock, but that they consume too much power. So they need to use sort of quartz crystals that you'd have in a typical wristwatch. So there's a lot of effort to stop those clocks drifting. So we're limited to about 18 months, but people are working on that. And so in the next you know decade, we'll have instruments that can go down for five years. The other thing that's happened again in the Pacific Northwest is we now have cabled observatories where we have seismic sensors on the end of cables. Um, both Canadians have one that extends off Vancouver Island and there's one in the US waters that goes off Oregon. And those are designed to basically operate for decades. And we've been working on those for about six years now. And they are great because they give us a very long-term data set. And we also get the data back um, immediately. You know, one of the problems with an autonomous instrument um, that records data is you put it down and if something goes wrong, you don't know until you come back a year or two later that, that it went wrong. So the, cab the cabled observatories are really potentially Ooh, yeah. changing things. So that's, that's kind of wild to think then. You really could capture uh, an entire year in the life of a fin whale because the, the technology is now caught up to their migration routes and their movements and seasonal breeding patterns and things like that. Yes, yeah, so we, we can track how their calling varies throughout the year. The one thing you have to remember is that we can't detect a fin whale if it's not making a sound. So acoustics is a very important tool in studying big whales because there's, you know, a the, lot of the two, approaches you might use with a smaller animal where you could catch it and sort of try and observe it in some environment you really can't do so you're limited to sort of looking at them from ships or airplanes and now people are starting to do that from satellites but then you only see them at the surface and certainly on a ship it's hard to be there all the time you can tag them um, but that's quite expensive and it's a limited number and so acoustics are, is a very powerful tool but it also limits you to only seeing the, the whales or hearing the whales that make a sound. So for instance, off our coast, we know the whales are there year round, but the fin whales don't make many sounds in the summer. They make a, a, le a, a less loud, a quieter um, 40 Hertz. So slightly higher frequency call um, when they're feeding, but it's not as common in the summer. What does a fin whale sound like? You mentioned, of course, it's below the threshold of human hearing. But when you do dial it up, uh, how do you actually tell a fin whale from an earthquake? Okay, well, we've got some sound recordings. So maybe, I know we could play the earthquake one first. Um, that's just a little swarm of earthquakes. And to me, they sound like thunderclaps or... Um, So that, that's an earthquake speeded up. Okay. I think we're done now. Um, so that, that was a swarm of earthquakes, small earthquakes above a volcano. And, and that speeded up 75 times, because again, they're at sort of, most of their energy is at 10 to 20 hertz. So you wouldn't be able to see them. And I listened to them at 75 times, because that's the speed we played things back when I was a graduate student. But but then if we if we have we can play the fin there's a fin whale singlet sound which is just a single note from the fin whale
And that, that's probably enough, but. So, so the chirp, that hear, repetitive chirp. Yeah, repetitive chirp. And remember that speeded up 75 times. So it's about, they're making about two or three mm -hmm. a minute. And then you heard pauses in that. And that's when the whales come into the surface to breathe. So they come to the surface, they stop when they come to oh, breathe. Wow. And then they just go back down and make that sound. And, you know, we, we have whales that we had one whale that we could actually track that basically just didn't really go anywhere. It was just going around in circles. And it, it made that sound for 18 hours. Um, the 18 other thing hours. That we're kind of in 18 hours and it stay it stayed very close to above a hydrothermal vent. And the, these black smoke events are putting a lot of nutrients into the water column a mile and a half beneath the surface. So they're quite deep. But there's some evidence that those nutrients actually feed some zooplankton and other animals that basically go all the way down near to the bottom of the ocean to graze on um, the, the, uh, the bacteria and the microbes that are in those hydrothermal fluids. And so the, there's some evidence that there's actually more zooplankton near hydrothermal vents. So we actually speculated that maybe the whales were hanging out in that region because, above a volcano because there was more food in the middle of the winter. And we don't know whether that's true. And it's probably a fanciful idea. I don't think many biologists would believe that, but it was our idea why this, because we often <laughs> recorded whales that just stayed in the same place. But they may, in breeding, they may have, it, they may just be territorial. You know, because we only ever, we'd over, usually just hear one whale that was close to the network and the others would be further away. Well, so in that case, are you working with whale biologists or ecologists to try to put together the seismology with, you know, their, their tracking and their tagging information? Um, we haven't done as much of that integration as we should, but we did, we did do a very um, interesting study. One of my students, Michelle Weirathmuller, who's graduated, she worked with somebody called Kate Stafford, who's at the University of Washington, who is an expert in marine mammal acoustics. And they actually looked at the fin whale calls. And because we have so many instruments deployed off our coast, um, you know, they used to be autonomous and now they're permanent. Um, they were able to look at 10 years worth of data. And we, the earlier um, fin whale we heard was what, we, what was called a singlet, where it's a whale just making a single note at a very um, constant interval, almost like a metronome. But they heard a second song where the whale actually alternated between two di slightly different notes with a different spacing between them. And maybe we could play that. That's the fin whale doublet. Um, audio. I feel like I'm going to be an expert in speaking fin whale by the end of tonight. Almost as good as a Reba McIntyre song. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. That's probably enough, but that, it's not quite as regular as the um, the singlet. So when they're alternating notes, the spacing changes a little bit. But what they discovered is they looked at ten years of data, and at the very start there was just the singlet song, and and they caught they the biologists call them songs, even though it's just a single note, and then. Gradually, the doublet songs were a few of them, and then that became the predominant song. And by the very last year, there were no singlets left. So basically, the whales had changed, had learned a new song, and had changed what you know what they were singing. And I don't, people don't really know why that's the case. They don't know whether they're picking up this song from fin whales that are coming in from a different area, or why they would be doing it. And that I guess that's something that's observed in ornithology. But they wrote an interesting paper on that. And then the other thing that was really interesting is that the frequency at which the fin whales vocalize has changed. So earlier in the decade, they were at 20 hertz, and then it gradually decreased to more like 18 hertz for the, for the lower note in the doublet. 
Uh, and again, people don't really know why that is so. And blue whales have been observed for 50 years. They, they make sounds at about 16 hertz, and their frequency has been slowly decreasing and is now down to, I think, 14 hertz in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. And there are some areas, for instance, where people speculate that animals change the frequency of their sound because of they want to get away from noises made by humans. Um, but in in this case, the container ships that are going across the Pacific are making sounds that are actually slightly, slightly lower frequencies than the um, fin and blue whales. So the fact that their sound frequency is going down, um, they're actually going to moving towards somewhere where there's more noise. And so the only idea that I think makes sense is that the populations have been recovering of these big whales um, after whaling, after the moratorium in whaling in the 1970s. So maybe now the whales are close together so they can sing at more cl something that's close to their natural frequency without having to worry about being drowned out um, by ships because they're actually, they're close to each other. So they don't need their sound to transmit over as over a larger distance, but that's total speculation. We don't know. Okay. Don't know. Uh, my next question was going to be if the kind of data that you're collecting this seismographs and whale seismological data can tell us about how whale populations are doing uh, in the face of human induced things like ships and ocean noise or even climate change? Um, yes, it can. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest in how the populations of whales are recovering because nearly all the big baleen whale species um, were either threatened or endangered. Um, and monitoring how their population recovers is, is really important. And for both um, blue whales, I think in up in the Southern Ocean, the numbers are still greatly down and are only recovering quite slowly. But in the Northeast Pacific, I think many people believe that blue whales are back up to where they were before. And the fin whale populations have been recovering at 7% a year. So it's very, very fast growth. For, for an animal that has a gestation period of about a year, you know, for the population to be increasing um, by 7% a year. So that, that's very good news, um, but it's difficult yeah, to get that good. data. And that data is collected by NOAA, but from people going out on ships and counting the whales, which is very painstaking. So there's a lot of interest in being able to use acoustic data to characterize populations, um, but that's extremely challenging because you, you have to accurately know how far away each sound is you hear, and then you can um, get the density of sounds. You can say how many sounds are being made per day within a square mile. And then you have to get data about how often the animal makes a sound. And that's, that's the trickiest part. And people are trying to work on that with tagging data. Um, so a lot of what we have is still sort of relative counts, you can see the number, you know, and I certainly can see from the data I look at, there are many more fin whale calls now than there were 20 years ago. But getting an absolute count is difficult. Um, but the, it is it is important to listen to the acoustics because you can, um, you know, certainly the Navy's very interested in their tracking range ranges where they're, you know, they're doing exercises. They will listen for marine mammals and observe for them as well visually. Um, to make sure they're not in the way before they start their exercises. Um, and you can also, obviously, you can track animals to see whether they are impacted by anthropogenic sounds from the noises of ships. And, you know, and, you know when I put my other hat on as an active seismologist, we actually go out and make sounds with air guns, and those can potentially um, affect whale behavior. So again, monitoring their sounds to see how they're affected by that is an important tool. Yeah. Okay. So there's, it's more than just the sounds traveling at these earthquake levels, understanding whale sounds and how sound works in these environments is critical. Yes. No, it, it's, it's, that is very critical and um, how, how sounds influence them. And, and clearly they, they can't be that sensitive to sounds because they're making very loud sounds. So presumably they're not hurting each other and they must have some mechanism when they make the sound that it doesn't deafen them. But there is concern, there is concern that loud sounds um, 
not so much can harm animals, although that's possible, but that it interferes with their feeding patterns. And so if, if the animals aren't feeding because they're disturbed by the sound, then obviously that's bad for them. So trying to understand how they interact with sound is important. And, you know, we have now one of the, uh, haven't spoken about it, but we did a very large experiment, something called the Cascadia Initiative, where they put seismic sensors all the way for, for Vancouver Island, all the way off Washington coast and Oregon, all the way down to Northern California, extending several hundred miles offshore. Um, and that potentially gives us the ability to see whether the distribution of fin whales and blue whales is impacted by ships, because you we know we know where the shipping lanes are for ships coming out of the Columbia or from the Straits of Juan de Fuca and sailing across the Pacific. So you could potentially try and see um, whether the whales are avoiding that. Uh, and, and that's not been done yet, but it's something that we might try and use this data to do. Exciting frontiers. So I'm going to give everybody, uh, this is your chance. Folks, go ahead and start typing up your questions and comments into the chat and into the comments boxes. Uh, I'm going to look there in just a moment to start asking Dr. Wilcock your questions. But my last question for you is going to be maybe a simple one, but what have you learned that maybe was unexpected or the most surprising? Well, it's... Well, I, th I think the, f the, f the fact that we learned, we found that whales were heading north in the fall when everybody said they should be coming south in the migration, that was something that interested us. Um, I think what we learned about the song patterns changing um, was interesting. It uh, was unexpected to me. I'm sure it wasn't um, unexpected to biologists, but I'm... I'm not an expert in this, so I'm sort of an amateur, so I really enjoy that. Um, I think, you know, the, the ability to track, we haven't talked much about blue whales, but blue whales make sounds that are similarly loud to a fin whale, but they loud, last for 10 to 20 seconds, and there's not as many blue whales. So we can actually track those with instruments that are spaced further apart. And so I think we're finding some really interesting things about um, the swimming patterns of blue whales. And there are a lot of blue whales off Southern California um, that are known to head north, um, uh, migrate in the summer. But we're finding that some of those are migrating through our area in the winter. And we're, we're sort of still in the midst of that research. But I think that's really exciting because we're working with this network where we can track them over um, five or 600 miles. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's really interesting then. Well, we'll have to we'll have to have you back on the show to give us an update on blue whales in the future. Yeah, well, I'm a very slow researcher, so it might be quite a long time, but I like kind of <laughs> doing a little bit of this all the time, so we're making progress. But excellent. Well, uh, are you ready for some audience questions? Absolutely. All right, they've got some good ones. The first one is from Emily, who writes, could this technology be used to mitigate ship strikes for the North Atlantic right whales, especially due to diminishing populations? Well, I believe the technology is being used for that. Um, you know, off the, off the coast of Massachusetts, they have a network of um, buoys with hydrophones that are listening for right whales. And when they hear right whales, um, they then basically warn ships to slow down. And so ships are slowing down in an attempt um, to mitigate that. You know, it is a challenge because not all whales are vocalizing, but if they hear whales in the area, they can warn ships um, that that's the case. And if ships slow down, it's possible for whales to swim away. Part of the problem is um, that if you're in front of a ship and it's coming towards you and you hear the sound, um, if you swim in either direction, you actually hear more sound because the sound's coming around from the back of the ship. So that probably confuses whales from to swim away from it. So ship strikes are a major problem. And they're doing similar things in the Bight of California with blue whales, where again, they're, when whales are in the area based on both acoustics and sightings, 
um, their warning ships to slow down. And I think that has been effective at reducing, not completely eliminating ship strikes. We have an exhibit gallery at the Museum of Natural Sciences in our Nature Research Center with a North Atlantic right whale uh, that has the rostrum or so from the top of the skull coming down the front that's cracked totally in half where we're fairly certain uh, this enormous whale, uh, 55, 60 feet long, was hit by, uh, by a ship. Like only a ship is big enough and strong enough to do that kind of a damage to, to a whale. Um, and I mean, the, the damage is pretty impressive. And I get asked that question a lot when, you know, when I'm on site at the museum is, why don't the whales just get out of the way? And my n normal answer was, well, whales have been on Earth for millions of years and big metal container ships have been on Earth for 150 years. So the whales aren't quite used to it. There's no evolutionary, you know, built in sort of a thing to help them escape from a big ship like that. But uh, I'm glad I've got an even better answer to that question now, which is, well, all the noise is coming from the back of the ship. Which way are they supposed to know to go? Yeah, no, I th yeah, I think I, th I think that's an explanation I've heard, and it it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but whales strike stri whales being struck, I think, is one of the major problems now, and and that's hard to mitigate because you can't, you know, we can't expect all commercial shipping to go at half speed, or that's probably unrealistic. But if there are clever ideas to basically warn whales and do something that makes them swim away, that would certainly be beneficial. Absolutely. All right, next question is from Penelope. Do fin whales react to the sounds of an earthquake? I don't think so. I, I, um, I don't think either of the sound recordings, I do have sound recordings, I surely should have had one, when there are earthquakes and fin whales, and the fin whales sing right through them. And and there is there are some there are I think people are described as charlatans who've been arguing that large earthquakes actually deafen whales and cause them to ground, but I don't think there's any evidence of that. So that they, they and if they're above a volcano, some of these volcanoes where we work, you you can have hundreds of earthquakes a day. So the fin whales there will be very used to earthquakes. So maybe if the fin whales in an area off the east coast where an earthquake's quite rare then the fin whale would be shocked by the earthquake. But it, it's hard for me to believe that the whales will be shocked, by, will be surprised by the earthquakes that we record in these volcanoes that are very volcanically active. But it's, it's an interesting question. And it's certainly, people again worry about the effects of sound um, from seismic exploration on whales. And I think one of the arguments that it may not be as bad as people think is that there are whales in areas where earthquakes and earthquakes are very, you know, are very loud underwater. They, the big earthquakes make much more sound um, than humans would make with a, a seismic air gun. All right. Excellent. All right. Uh, Earl is asking, do lower Hertz travel further underwater than the higher Hertz? Yes, um, water is doesn't attenuate sounds very much. So sounds can travel very large distances in the ocean. People may have heard of the SOFAR channel. There's essentially a sound duct in the ocean that's a few hundred meters at a few hundred meters depth. Where if you make a sound in that, if the sound starts traveling down, it refracts and bends back upwards. If it starts traveling up, it bends and comes back down. So you basically duct the sound in that so far channel. And those sounds can travel right across the ocean um, at the frequencies that we're talking about. Now, fin whales are not making sounds in that, but these sounds travel a long way. But once you get to very high frequencies, um, the sounds don't travel as far. So, you know, to map the sea floor, people send sound waves and bounce them off the seafloor. And if you want that to work in the full depth of the ocean, you have to use something at maybe about 10 kilohertz frequency because any higher frequencies will get attenuated before traveling down and coming back up. So the high frequencies do get attenuated, but these low frequencies, there's really not much attenuation. Um, 
so that the sound gets quiet as you get further away just because the sound sort of spreading out over a larger area but it, it's not attenuating very much uh, the next question actually came in twice once on youtube and once over on facebook how do these whales produce the sound do they have a special organ uh and and then Cindy was asking, how do they make these incredible noises? I think that's not completely understood, although there is research on that, which I may not be up to speed in. They, they do have things like vocal cords, and I think it's believed that they circulate air rather than expelling air. They're just moving air between around internally within them to make these sounds. But they, they also have various... Um, structures they have um that are filled with the oil you know that that was one of the th things that people used to exploit when they hunted them which may be associated with making these sounds but i don't think it's incredibly well known and one of the you know if if the if the pressure changes you would ex actually expect as you went deeper the the frequency of the sound to go up and so one argument is that whales are making the sounds at exactly the same depth but another um, suggestion is they're actually making the sound by a mechanism where it doesn't depend, the frequency doesn't depend on the pressure at which they're making it. But that's a really good question. And people uh, have tried to figure that out. And again, it's a problem is you, you can't get a whale in a tank and observe it making one of these sounds. So you have to, um, you know, by dissecting uh, a dead whale that's washed up, you can look at its internal structure and then you have to try and figure out how it might be making the sound giving given sort of it what it looks like but it, you can't actually observe it um, and so that's challenging all right uh next question are both males and females making sounds no, it's believed that both for fin and blue whales, the very loud sounds are made by the males. Um, and so again, that's not easy to tell, but people have you know followed them around at the surface and that's the inference. So it's believed to be associated with breeding. Now they can make these sounds, um, particularly blue whales will make the same kind of sounds, but they'll just make individual sounds. And those may be made by both sexes, but I think these long sequences of repetitive sounds are just the males, so that's what's believed. And the other thing is, oh, the fin whales do make sounds when they transit to probably stay together as a pod. And I don't know wh I, whether those are made by both sexes. I don't, I'm not sure whether that's known. All right, excellent question. Uh, the next one, also from Penelope, can you use sounds to train whales to leave an area so that the Navy, for example, can do exercises without harming them? I don't know whether anybody's done that. Um, you know, the, the, you know, there have been problems, you know, with grounding of whales associated with the Navy sonars. And... I think the belief is that some of the Navy sonars sound like a killer whale. And so that whales are unused to oh. the Navy sonars will respond thinking it's a killer whale and will try and get out of there. Whereas if the, if the Navy exercises regularly in an area, the whales will learn um, to distinguish them and will largely ignore them. And so there's been a lot of work there, beak whales that have, have had a lot of groundings. And that's been somewhat challenging to try to figure that up but I, I think um, I think that's the conclusion is that maybe they're, they're mistaking these for killer whales so but it, it's it's potential but I don't know how you would train a whale so yes if they if they know a sound is not a threat then they're more likely to ignore it but there's still a problem that when there's a lot of noise being made that can interfere with animals feeding because they're using echo the baleen whales are filter feeders, so they're basically just scooping up large amounts of waters and filtering out zooplankton. But a lot of um, the smaller whales, they're basically using echolocation, um, and big whales, sperm whales use that too. So the, the tooth whales are using echolocation to find food. Right, right. So if 
the humans are making sounds that can interfere with their feeding. So I think that's probably almost a bigger concern that just not, you know, all human sound that's being made at the wrong frequency is potentially stopping animals feeding. And certainly in Puget Sound, where I am, it's there's a lot of concern with the Aroka populations and they're struggling. And one of the concerns is just how much noise is being just made by all the shipping coming up and down it. And again, that's a very challenging problem to deal with. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of the, uh, like thinking about the current crisis with the Suez Canal being blocked up and just how many ships are going to be hanging out, uh, waiting to pass through. And I mean, just how many ships pass through in a day anyway, but all of that activity in a highly trafficked area creates problems for all of the wildlife that also use that space. Like it's, it's just not us and our big ships hanging out in the ocean. Yeah, and it's a problem that the previous question about does sound attenuate? Well, sound doesn't attenuate, especially these low frequencies. So one ship making a lot of noise is actually the sound pollution covers a, la a, a large reason, region. So that's particularly these lower frequencies. So that is, you know, that that's a major concern. And that's not something that there's an obvious solution. Maybe ships can become quieter with time. And there's certainly people thinking about how you can develop quieter ships, but that technology is probably some way off. All right. Next question here from Martin. Have you heard any hybrid whales? If so, how do they differ from their parent species? I don't well, know if I've heard of famous, whales. There was a famous whale um, that Bill Watkins, who I mentioned um, Woods Hole, who um, first introduced me to fin whales, he did some work on that towards the end of his career, and I think it was at 52 hertz. So it was making sounds at this odd frequency, and the guess was that might have been a hybrid whale, fin whale, blue whale. I don't think people really knew. I don't think anybody ever saw that whale. But yes, yeah, so, so that was a whale that was going around making very odd sounds that was potentially hybrid. Um, and because it was so distinctive at 52 hertz, so no other whales, and that was at the time that was tracked by um, the Navy has a lot of um, classified um, listening stations um, associated with submarines. They have less of those now because I think their technologies evolved, um, but they still have some. But they at that time, you know, the the, the, the sonar technicians, the people looking to the Navy, would hear this odd sound, and it was all over. The Pacific, and nobody ever figured what it was, but it may well have been a hybrid whale. Very good question, Martin. All right, last one question is from Ashley. What is your favorite field story? Uh, um, well, my my field story is that my most favorite when I go out and it's calm and I don't get seasick because. I get seasick. And so one of the tough things is when I um, chose to come to graduate school, you have to apply to graduate school. And I decided I wanted to be a marine geoscientist, but I'd never been out on a ship. So you discover on your first cruise whether you get seasick or not. And so I'm chronically seasick. And I guess over time, I've got less seasick. You do get used to it. Um, so I've had good times when I've gone on ships when I haven't been sick. And this is not a good story to tell, but one, I went out on one cruise that was on a ship with two hulls, um, which went out for a very long time. And so it, was, it wasn't really on two hulls. It was basically like a barge. So it moved all over the place and everybody got sick. And I remember at the start of that cruise, sitting there feeling sick, but actually feeling very kind of excited that I wasn't the only person who was sick. And there were actually some people who were worse than me. And there's some really first way I got better from that. And I felt good at the end of that, but that, that may not be a good sea story, but that, that made me kind of, kind of really happy. And it was also showed me that sea sickness is very strongly psychological. And on the same cruise, the captain, who was a really great guy, he just came back and patted me on the show and said, you need, you stop being sick. You need to come and eat some food, right? And that actually worked. And so then now I realize that a lot of it's in my head. And so that makes me more happy at sea. And I don't, I get sick still, but not as badly as I used to. 
there you go, kids. If you want to be a marine geoscientist, you can be a seasick one and still get the job done. All right, I'm gonna check the chat over here one more time just to be sure. It looks like we asked all the questions and our time is up, so we did it. Dr. Wilcock, thank you for being on the program tonight and sharing your stories and research with us. Okay, it was, well, it was really great to talk to you. It's always fun to find people who are interested in my research. And I, I do a lot of stuff, but I always find that people are the most interested in whales. So it's, I think it's kind of cool to be able to do a little bit of this. Well, you know, I was, I was sitting here thinking, come October when it's uh, Geosciences Week, maybe we'll get in touch and have you back then for a program with the museum. I'd love to do we'll that. We'll talk about this earthquakes really and volcanoes. Okay, that would be cool. I do want to thank uh, a couple of organizations who helped bring Dr. Wilcock to us, the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology and the Seismological Society of America. Uh, Pearl in particular was a great help at connecting us and bringing this program together. So thanks to her. I wanna thank the producer behind the scenes on the show tonight, who's making all of this happen, bringing the show live to you and the other staff at the Museum of Natural Sciences who help this program go out every single week. I hope that everybody will tune in again next Thursday night at seven o'clock. I'll be talking with author Tony Hiss about half earth, setting aside half of the land as protected spaces for wild plants and wild animals, wildlife. Uh, don't miss that one. He's got a new book out, uh, which you should be able to get from the museum's website very soon. Information about that will be coming up on the museum's website. That's naturalsciences.org. That's where you can get all of the information about upcoming programs, including this one, every single week at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And if you don't already, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel below, and you can follow us on social media. Of course, we're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks everybody for joining me this evening. Hope you enjoyed the program. We'll see you again next week. Bye everybody. <laughs>